Take me home, country roads, to the place I belong. Tararua, Aotearoa, take me home, country roads. Kia ora and welcome to the Meg Makes Knitting and Craft podcast. I'm coming to you from Pongaroa in the Tararua district of Aotearoa, New Zealand. My name is Megan. Welcome, welcome back. Um, thank you for joining me. Today I want to talk to you about some of my knitting because that's what I do and uh, it's the most wonderful thing in my life really at the moment. Uh, so my, um, I live in a, on a six hectare property with 24 calves, or is it 25? I can never quite remember. A hunterway dog who is looking quite urgently out the door at potential rabbits at the moment so we might hear her joining us shortly. Uh, a cat and a goat called Polly. Um, up until a few days ago we also had a, a fawn which I'm going to tell you more about shortly and uh, she's fine she's just gone to a nicer home and uh, yes and I do a lot of knitting and spinning and cross stitch and I do some quilting, you haven't seen my quilting yet, but we'll get there. Uh, and I have so much to share with you today. So I, my first, first thing I want to talk about is my uh, Felix Cardigan by Amy Christophers. I hand spun this from some, uh, uh, I actually bought the fleece all pre-carded and dyed and combed and all of that kind of thing. Uh, it's the first time I've done that. It is 80% Coriadale and 20% Tussa Silk. Apparently Tussa Silk means that the silkworms have been fed, oh there's my dog, uh, been fed exclusively on uh, oak leaves, which I find quite interesting. Uh, so I bought this, sorry I'm just trying to find my page of reference. Um, I bought this, uh, I made this and finished it a few days ago. You'll be so proud of me, I actually blocked it. Uh, because I thought it was potentially a teeny bit short. And then I, I still can't find the page. Here we are. Uh, and then, uh, so I blocked a little bit of extra length into it. But I have to say, it is the first time I've made garment. And I think it fits, like... I'm comfortable with the fit. Um, so let me just show you first. So here we are, just uh, sitting ooh, just above the hips because I tend to wear dresses with it. And I'm sorry about the color, the lighting, but that's just life. So the this is the second time I've knitted the Felix cardigan. I The first um, one was in episode two, and that was... Uh, also with a hand spun, which I held double with uh, Roman Kitsilk case. Uh, that one ended up enormous. Way, way, way too large. So, I, I, I had bought this to spin up, and I thought, goodness, um, why don't I re-knit the same cardigan and attempt to make it fit this time? And it was such a great learning project because I had the one there that was too big and I knew I could I, I knew how much too big it was and um, I, I could really play with it and I did a lot more stopping and trying things on and and checking so in the end I was really really happy with the result and I think you know you end up getting uh, really good value from the pattern if you if you want to knit it again it's quite a quick to knit pattern um, I think the, the wool is supposed to be Worsted or Aran weight. Uh, in the end, I I still didn't get gauge or anything useful like that. So a lot of the my sizing was just based on putting it next to the one that I already had that was too big or trying it on, and that that's fine because I was happy with the with the texture of the fabric. So um, oh, what else should I say? Oh, so yes, yeah, so I've got. Can you see the length of the sleeves? Yeah, just, just down to, to past the wrist here. Uh, nice and cosy and warm. Amusingly, I'm sitting here thinking, oh, 
how we're going to go with this podcast because tomorrow is actually the first day of summer here in um, New Zealand, so it's it's not really cardi weather, but that's all right. It's very humid. It looks like it's actually going to have a quick thunderstorm shortly. Um, yeah, so oh, the honeydew wool came from Anna Grattan, uh, who is a fibre supplier, dyer, producer in uh, fielding in uh, the Manawatu district in New Zealand, and uh, she was she was fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's got uh, how's the colour looking? Yeah, you can see just all these little sort of streaks of the goldy colour, the honey colour, I guess. Yeah, and the rest of it was sort of a mixture of uh, just a natural cream and and brown and so on. So I really like the way um, it comes out in these little stripy streaks and things like that. Um, I'm really looking forward to, because I, I card my own wool, and I have a lot of different coloured fleeces sitting in large we call them fadges, like big wall packs. We're talking sort of one and a half metres by one and a half metre squares <laughs> are cubes. And they're, you know, sort of wedged around my house. But luckily my house doesn't has extra space at the moment because we don't have a kitchen or a bathroom yet. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. So, um, yes, yeah, so I have all these different coloured fleeces. And I'm really looking forward to carding up some bats on my Ashford drum carter and just uh, seeing, playing with different um, uh, textures, you know, colours within those bats and seeing how it all comes out. So I, I've learned quite a lot recently with my, with my spinning um, in terms of just allowing the, the fibre to do what it needs to do and, um, and then choosing what to, to knit afterwards. Uh, from it so it's, it's a very different process from going oh this is the recommended yarn and you know and pressing click online and waiting for it to come to you in the post um, it's really about sort of handling the actual fiber and just going oh, okay this is it's just not wanting to spin as fine as I was hoping or whatever and um, I'm just going to have to make an Aaron Waite jersey or, or whatever. Um, the other thing about this that's gorgeous about this Felix um, cardigan is the lovely chevron pattern there on the raglans. I, ju I just think it's so simple and so lovely. So I, yes, I did, I did do it cropped because I, I liked the picture and the pattern. Uh, you probably, I should pop it up here somewhere um she wears it over a dress and and it's quite loose and it's yeah I I think that's kind of how it should be worn I'm not sure that I sewed my buttons on straight they were sort of pulling a wee bit and things so I did line it all up and put the stitch markers there and measure it all but you know I, th I think in the process of actually sewing on the button things can shift a little bit and I have but uh you know, you move a lot and it is, it's not like a, a dress up cardigan, is it? It's not like you're going to be sort of being photographed for the Oscars on the red carpet. So it doesn't matter too much. The buttons, um, I really like the buttons. They are ooh, blowing out massively. Yeah. Yeah, what if I do that? Oh, oh that might help. There we are. They're actually, they're actually dark on the back and around the edge, and they're quite textured. They look almost like old, cracked varnish on an old, old piece of furniture or something. So I really like those, but they were very expensive. Um, I didn't want to buy buttons online this time. So I was in Wellington a few weeks ago, a couple of, oh, th about three weeks ago, and I... Uh, I decided to go into Spotlight, which is a big box, Australian-owned um, art and craft, homewares kind of store, stocks everything, uh, to buy buttons, and I could not believe the price. They only came in packs of five, and of course I needed six. I'm wondering if most most garments need six, so they pack them in packs of five on purpose. I'm not sure. But anyway, I, I, uh, I bought buttons that were slightly larger than the pattern said because I found in my last one that uh, the buttons of 20 millimeters were just slipping through. So I got 23 millimeter buttons and I had to get two packs and it was $34 for two packs. 
and I have four left over, so goodness knows where they'll end up, but hopefully they'll find a home very soon. So that's my Felix cardigan. Yay, it's so successful, I'm so happy. Um, I, I really think it's going to have a good place in my wardrobe. It really suits my sort of current uh, goals for how I want to present myself, which I've discovered is called, have I said this before? I don't know. It's called Weasley Core. <laughs> and I, I just, I love that so much. I just, you know, somewhere between sort of flowery tartan dresses and um, uh, woolly hand knits is really kind of my thing. And uh, big hand knitted socks and, and uh, leather boots that are quite scuffed and so on. And, and it works really well. It's sort of uh, out here on the farm, you know, um, it's very easy when you're out on a farm because you're often just suddenly having to go out and tackle a cow or something. Uh, and it's very easy to find yourself just in sort of gumboots and tracksuit pants and um, all the time. And it's, it just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel very feminine. And uh, the, the, the basic country look, country girl look in New Zealand is quite horsey and quite sporty. Um, but I, I'm not horsey. And I'm not particularly sporty at the moment either. So I don't really want to be wearing jodfers and riding boots and uh, in slim-fitting, terribly, terribly expensive uh, jackets and things. So, uh, so yeah, big woolly jerseys and dresses, that's me. Uh, and it's working, I love it. Now, and hopefully one of these days I'll be able to like sew my own dresses. That's, that's a plan. I bought, I bought a sewing machine. A while back and the only thing it's really been used for is uh, quilts which is great um, although I do kind of straight line quilts I'll show you those one day and uh, mending really but we'll get there I'd like to learn how to sew but it seems like <sighs> there's enough sort of uh, voodoo involved in trying to get a knitted garment to fit and I know how to knit so yeah anyway I'm drinking a lemon and lime tea and it's in a little handmade Loch Ness mug and she came from Loch Ness sent to me by uh, my stepdaughter she's very very good at gifts oh I don't think it was sent to me I think it was sent to my partner but he likes bigger mugs so um, but I just think it's so pretty that I have to... It's that dreaded colour teal again. Um, but there we are. It's perfect for water, isn't it? Mm. Oh, that's very lemony. Quite warm. Okay. So, my second... I have two finished objects for you this week. I didn't really list off what I was going to talk about. I have two finished objects and two cast-ons and lots of life. <laughs> so my second finished object is uh, the Wild Orchid Shawl by Sue Lazenby. Now this is a free pattern on Ravelry. It has three of uh, maybe four different options in terms of width and length and shape. Um, and I had splurged for myself on some wool, but I didn't uh, want to spend buy too many skeins. So uh, when I was out shopping one day, and so I bought three, and I've done the the most narrow one, the narrowest one. There we are. So <laughs> I, I told you the story last last episode about my scales and uh, buying those. And uh, the idea was that, uh, you know, you, because I had three skate, three balls, and I just needed to change direction once I got halfway through the second ball. It didn't quite work. <laughs> I keep thinking, when a scarf's on, no one knows that it's not even, do they? So there it is. It's so beautiful. The, the wool is DMC Heritage. It's an... Uh, a double knit merino wool um, and the colour, 
the shade is shade 12 so it's a it looks gray but actually it has this is how much I have left so I'm wondering if I can get that to focus there we are it's I don't know if you can see it's it's got some red and blue sort of flecks in it and it's really lovely I just thought the color was the most elegant gorgeous thing so I have made this, this is a, probably about the third thing I've made with lace and I am getting better at it uh, I've taken on the advice that somebody told me to put stitch markers between each section so you can always check you know <laughs> I know it, so it sounds really obvious, but I didn't re hadn't really thought about that. But, you know, if you've got a 13 stitch section and you get to the end of it and you've got a stitch left over, you know you've made a mistake in there. But this was really, the the orchid part was actually, this this part of the pattern was quite, um, the, the most effective part was quite easy. But there are a lot of mistakes in this part here. Um, and I just found it really really difficult to fix uh, you know like uh, there's points where I don't know if you can see like around here where we end up with extra big holes and things because sometimes that like if you drop a, there's a there was a lot of yarn overs and things and if you drop those in a collection of you know knit three together and yarn over this and slip slip knit and so on and you drop uh, it's it, it, picking up yarn overs that have popped off the needle is really really tricky <laughs> so interesting things that happen I, I I wanted to knit as much as I could right to the end of the wool as as you can see that that's all I have left um, so I didn't finish at the end of a pattern um, I don't think that matters but it really I didn't get to the point where I had narrowed down to the same as the other end but I, I'm looking at it as a slightly asymmetric scarf and it was a little bit short I should have really bought four balls but that would have made it a $60 scarf and it's just quite a lot to spend isn't it especially when you're like not paying it was a free pattern you know you're not paying the designer and you're paying just a lot for the wool it's quite quite luxurious so I, I stretched it quite a lot when I blocked it I blocked this too there's two things I've blocked before showing you on the podcast ah, I'm winning at life um, <laughs> oh you've got to, got to improve step by step don't you but you can see how as people say it's so drapey it really really is it's quite an elegant scarf and I'm, I'm really it's the kind of thing I'm quite looking forward to wearing when I visit the capital and and you know go and see a show or do whatever I do there um, I will care <laughs> because I don't know how much Weasley core is really uh, is the thing and it's, oh I don't know Wellington's quite a groovy city it's often uh, it's been voted like the best dressed city in the world quite often um, everyone has their own look and they really are confident about it but it's not it's not too try hard most of it's not too expensive it's just there's a lot of I think it's the nature of also having a having a city where people walk a lot and there's quite a lot of wind uh, not as much as Pongaroa I have to say but there is quite a lot of wind so people are quite practical but they're also on show all the time you know if you're hiding in your car and just going from your car into the shop door it, well, you know who cares what you look like but in Wellington when you leave your house and then your public transport and walking everywhere it's like your whole day you know people can see you so I don't know there's just they've just got a, a little bit of cool it's quite an academic city and um, yeah hmm. I guess because it's you know it's where government is and uh, yeah it's just it's a very compact and wonderful place but quite different from the country where I live now ah oh, let's have a look so that's my second one I wonder if I have anything else I need to uh, tell you about that let's have a look so um, yes, I must update my uh, Ravelry pages uh, so that uh, people can actually see what I'm up have been up to because I've started to have people follow me on Ravelry, which is quite disturbing because you know I have 
about every six months I might put something on there. Mm. But I just need to be more efficient about the whole process. Yeah, so I was so proud of finishing everything. Um, all these things, got both, both of those, those items were done within the last uh, less than a month, you know, three or four weeks. I was quite proud about that. Um, really enjoyed it. So what happened with the, with the uh, shawl is that I cast on something else and I made quite a big mistake and had to rip back. And I famously don't like ripping back. I tend to just try and muffle my way through. But I, I, I cast on the next item I'm going to show you. Made, made quite a big error and had to rip back about... It's only about six hours work. But it took me six hours to realise that I completely made a rookie mistake. So let me tell you about my next cast on. Uh, I, I wanted to knit... Um, I have uh, showed you some um, dark fleece that I was given, dark brown, and I wanted to knit a big Aran cable knit um, work kind of farm jersey. Um, I work in the local farm centre and I really just, I like to have a big jersey on and uh, I am carrying sort of bags of milk powder and things around and today I sort of had, had to restack an entire pallet of like bags of compost and things so you know we I don't want to wear this down there but you know I don't want to be reduced to wearing polar fleece uh, so <laughs> I um I want to knit a bag for next winter um Aaron jersey and I thought I'd start now because um I'm going to spin it and also a big cable knit all over cable knit uh, sweater is going to take quite a long time to knit. So I, and then I had a huge battle trying to work out whether I was going to knit the, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's based on the Knives Out movie jersey. And there's a fabulous pattern there. And um, that's a paid for pattern um, that someone's done. And it's really good. But the main model is a man who has a fantastic physique. He's very tall and lean, but very broad in the shoulders and, and you know, real narrow waist, and it fits him perfectly. And I was just like, Ugh. apparently it has, you know, different options for different fits, but the, the female model version that they had in the photos, it wasn't so fond of. So I thought, gosh, maybe I'll just wait until that pattern's been out a bit longer. And I feel really bad that I can't remember the name of it, but I will put it down below or in the notes or something um, because it is beautiful. It's in my Ravelry queue um, or favourites. And uh, But I just thought, I'm going to wait until there's more ordinary people putting up their ordinary photos of them wearing it. You know, I just need to see how a, a middle-aged woman with a, a decent-sized bust is going to look in that, in that sweater and with how the shaping goes. And I do find, isn't Ravelry the... Uh, the most amazing thing in terms of you, you really get to see like it's just ordinary people with their ordinary bodies taking ordinary photos a lot of it and you really then can make a, a, a quite a good judgment if you've got enough projects on there a really good judgment as to how that pattern works for different shapes and, and abilities and yarn choices and things like that. So I do, I, I find it a fantastic resource. Um, anyway, so I decided instead for my first one to go for a free pattern that had hundreds of um, versions on there. And I thought also because of the nature of my yarn, uh, the stitch definition is not going to be that clear because I'm hand spinning my own fleece and it's all bobbly and uneven and so on uh, to the extent that we're almost calling it art yarn. So I wanted to show you like the different stages of what I'm actually working with. So I'm, I'm literally taking this. Oh, it smells so sheepy. <laughs> and this is it after I've washed it. Okay, so it's like, I'm not talking flash fleece here at all. I, I've washed it in a bucket with some wool wash and um, let it dry uh, out, sort of spread out on my veranda 
or right through my house if it's raining, um, <laughs> and for ages. And what I really loved about this one were the, the sun bleach tips on, on the ends and things like that. And I really wanted to leave those variations in there as much as I could. So as I carded, I, I realized that um, I, I end up coming out with these bats. Oops coming out with these bats, but I just couldn't for the life of me get rid of all the all the little lumpy bits in there, uh, little little balls, and I, I was pulling them out and trying to make it smooth, and then I went, just leave them in there, Meg, just leave them in there, and let the lumps all happen. So that's, that's stage, this one's stage three, and then, um, and then after I've spun it, and I just two-ply spun this, it comes out like so. And this, uh, if you haven't heard me talk about it before, I I, spit, I uh, wind these cakes by hand. Um, I have a spinning jenny, which I use sometimes, most of the time. But um, sometimes I, if I'm in the car, I find winding winding yarn into cakes in the car quite a good thing to do. Um, I just, just pop the skein around my knees um, and uh, use... At the moment, I was using a car jack handle, but my partner took it back <laughs> to jack the car because he wanted to take my tyres and to get them replaced because he's a lovely man. Um, yes, so at the moment I'm using a handle like this, a piece of wood, um, and it's bringing me out these perfect, perfect cakes. So yeah, uh, if, if in doubt, pop onto YouTube and, and find out how to do it. I'm sure it is not that much slower than buying the machine. Admittedly, I want the machine. Um, but the one I want, of course, is the Ashford one because I like the wood and so on. And we're talking $275. <sighs> so I'll save for that. <laughs> so that, that's what I'm knitting with. Um, so this this, this uh, fleece was given to me by a bloke down the road. Now, the actual pattern I ended up choosing was the Honeycomb Aran. And, oh, by pa uh, it's a Patterns pattern. Patterns pattern, and uh, I've just neglected to go and double check the name of the designer, but I will have that in the notes below. So I cast this on, and I'm it's knit in pieces, and I'll have to seam it and all of that. So on. never lose your cable needle. Although I have learned to cable without a needle, but I just don't want to add any complications on this one. It's quite dark and it's quite detailed. So here's the back, the start of the back. Now this is the second time, as I say, I, 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 I had to rip back the first time and I ended up getting quite frustrated and before I got going again, I, fi I finished my wild orchid scarf. I never really finished that bit of information, did I? I sort of got distracted. And anyway, so I am quite excited. It looks really good with this light. You can see all the um, all the different patterns there, actually. So yeah, it, I mean, obviously it's bobbly, fluffy wool, but you can still see the see the pattern. Now this is going to be a big jumper. I'm okay if this one's oversized. I want it to be quite long. I want it to go right down to my butt because, you know, my kidneys get cold sitting about and. Um, you know, where I'm out in the wind and, and so on quite a lot in the winter, and that's what I want to be wearing next year. Uh, yeah. What else do I want to say about the honeycomb, Erin? Oh, kept in when my daughter was 12. She made me this bag at school. So, yes. And she can't believe I still use it, but, you know, it's perfect. It's perfectly it has a little zip pocket which I should keep the cable needle in if I was really organized but I'm not all right let's have a look what else do I need to say about this oh so my mistake in the chart reading okay this, this is what a beginner I am I it you know it had it written out the pattern and it had three charts as well and I thought well I'll just get the pattern started and established and then I'll transfer to the charts because I know I know that once you've tackled the chart you know got the charts it's it's easier to just look at those but the the, the written out part of the pattern said rows one and two form the pattern repeat 
until it measures 43 centimetres, I think it was. So I thought, sweet. So I did rows one and two over and over again for a while. Like for six hours. And then I went to show my partner it and I went, that's not right. And he went, you're going up in straight lines. You're not getting any crisscrosses. And I'm like, what have I done? And then I realized that it's not a, a direct repeat of rows one and two, but where it says do row A, do row one uh, chart A, or pattern A, on the next row, or on the third row, it means do row three, not do row one over and over again. Does that make sense? So I, do, I was doing like row one and two over and over again. And in fact, you know, one of the charts has four, there's three different charts. You, and one has four rows, one has 18 rows, and one has eight rows. And it was like, oh, that's really stupid. I should have really worked that out. But um, I do find at the beginning of a pattern, I just follow the instructions step by step, absolutely to the letter, and don't necessarily have, because I haven't, I don't feel terribly experienced, I don't necessarily have a great concept of, of the actual structure of where it was going. So, yes, it, it's quite complicated actually, because I have my pattern on, on an iPad, and the charts are on a different page from the written out instructions and so on and it was like and then another page again for the um you know what cable four five uh, cable back five means and all of that kind of thing so i ended up having to make in my journal a chart here because you can't keep track of because each of the, the you're doing three charts at once and each of them has a different number of rows you have to absolutely write out every single row I've done 50 rows and it's like for example on row 50 on chart A I'm on row 2 on chart B I'm on row 14 and on chart C I'm on row 2 and you know you just have to kind of write it out by hand and and keep track of it so it's a bit tedious <laughs> for that but I am I'm getting the pattern now and it's going quite a lot quicker and uh, I am quite excited with the results so this one will um, the only issue I'm going to have is I've very enthusiastically started before I've knitted two, two kilometres worth of yarn. I've only done about 600 metres so far. So I think my knitting's going to, if I'm not careful, I might have to make sure I'm doing quite a few different knitting projects because obviously spinning is one of those things. I can only do it for so many, so long at a time because I, get, I just get a bit tired. Uh, and the carding as well. Luckily, it's better. I used to do all my carding by hand. That was a nightmare for the old neck, pulling like this. Um, yes, but now uh, I have a drum carder. It is faster, but it's still tedious and slow. <laughs> so I really, uh, I sort of aim to do some carding and some spinning each day, and I'm hoping that will keep up with my knitting but I get excited about the knitting because it's so much closer to the finished product so you just want to do that anyway I just have to make sure I like spinning but you know like I'm not doing one skein of you know hand dyed arty farty wool I'm trying to knit two kilometers of of I spin two kilometers of this <laughs> you know, it's, it's quite it's quite hard work however we have Audiobooks. I feel like I should like jump to, to like how I how I survive mentally while I do these things for hours and hours. And one of them is um, audiobooks. Uh, I just I'm I'm mad about them. And uh, so since I, I I've got to jump to this. Why not? Seems like a good way to explain how I managed to do so many hours and so many things. Um, so, since I saw you last, uh, two weeks ago, I have listened to The Great Gatsby uh, and uh, Emma by Jane Austen. Uh, so, those two I have listened to because <laughs> said uh, stepdaughter, she's very good at giving gifts, has given me, um, last year she gave me, she's over in England, and so she 
doing a bit of touristing and things and she went uh, and she actually bought these very beautiful um, you know gold edge just beautiful hardcover versions of both those books and given them to me which I, I so appreciate beautiful paper all of all of these things and I hadn't got around to reading them I started Emma but I hadn't finished it and the Great Gatsby is quite little when I I just hadn't because I haven't been sitting down and reading all that much because I have so many crafts I want to do so the audiobooks have come and uh, saved the day basically because she's coming visiting for Christmas and I just didn't want her to come for Christmas and not have actually read these books so I've done it now mm. The Great Gatsby was read by Jake um, Gyllenhaal and um, that was yeah it was really good it was quite um, quite punchy quite quick and I enjoyed that. And uh, Emma, I love the characterization and so on. I was just a little bit disappointed at the end because in the end, Jane Austen was a woman of her time and the the classism was absolutely solid. <laughs> you know, even though the whole thing was about whether someone, it was just like, you could tell that the author just felt it just was not possible in any way for Harriet to ever consider marrying Mr Knightley and I was like uh. see here in New Zealand we don't we don't really do class you know like classes as class does here uh, I guess it's because we're a colony and a fairly new new society and basically you know you are not really considered better if you went to better schools or anything like that nobody cares at all what your parents did or do there is just, and old money is not really a thing. So here it's, it's all about just how you choose to live your life and, and, uh, and you know, whether you behave with sort of some kind of dignity and, and self-respect within your, your sphere. And I, we just don't do, do it. I, I know on my visits to England, it was quite jarring, uh, the, the difference, differences in, in, um, and, and people talking about schools. There are some towns in, in New Zealand uh, where people do just spend an awful lot of time talking about what schools people are going to, whereas I came from Palmerston North and I don't think there were any private schools, it just, uh, which is the same as English public schools. It just wasn't really a thing, you know? We all just went to school. It's a bit like, like I like Germany's system where the government, all the schools are pretty equal and quite equally sort of funded and, and so on. I, I do appreciate that. Anyway! I'm having a little bit of a social rant because obviously I'm a bit of a socialist at heart. Uh, don't tell any of my neighbours. Uh, right, so that's my first cast on. And my second cast on, I suddenly realised yesterday that Christmas is approaching quite quickly, like in 25 days. And perhaps I should... We normally do present-free Christmases um, because my partner and I... You know, we just like to have, have the young people there and cook up a big feed and spend some time together and uh, listen to some good music and, you know, it, it's always midsummer here, so, you know, it's perfectly fine to have a barbecue. Uh, it, it's very casual and it's all about just being together as best you can. And in general, I have never had the kids on Christmas Day, uh, lots of split families and blended families and things, and my partner and I are both kind of a little bit casual about it, and other parents in our extended uh, sphere, not so casual about it, you know, and so last year we suddenly went, gosh, we've never had everybody to our place for Christmas, so we're going to make, insist, so last Boxing Day we just sent out the message to all the kids, they're all grown up now, and said, it's our place. On Christmas Day next year. <laughs> well, the daughter's coming from England, so we're pretty impressed with that, and we're getting her for Christmas Day. So, uh, as well as yeah, the other three as well, and any assorted partners and things that want to come are, are very welcome. Uh, so yes, we, we've got um, the the stepdaughter coming over from England for Christmas Day, and I suddenly and she, as I say, is a gift giver. I'm feeling pressured by my stepdaughter. <laughs> I suddenly went, oh, we haven't really organised anything. We haven't got any money. And uh, so I just thought, oh, 
Lord, I better maybe just make some beanies and things and, and you know, some handmade gifts would be lovely. But then I've put myself under a bit of pressure because uh, she's just got married. So that means there's five people to knit something for in the next 25 days. Mm. I might... <laughs> I do have another wee craft where I can hand make um, like coasters and things like that. Uh, and I have a whole pile of dust covers from my daughter's Harry Potter books and um, some foot rock flats, which is a very New Zealand cartoon. Uh, yeah, a few things like that. I might be able to make some placemats and things like that. That That's quick. So maybe it might be one or two hand knits and the rest of it something else. Um, Yes, yes, it just has to be not expensive <laughs> and uh, not too time consuming. Anyway, so I, last night I cast on a beanie um, because I also, as you know, I adore using leftovers. I love getting rid of the leftovers. So, uh, and three out of the four patterns uh, that I'm talking about today are free patterns. And this is... Pearl Soho's Classic Rib to Beanie, the beginning of it, and it is being, oh, hang on, there we are, ah, and it's so easy, I don't, because I was doing the, the, the cable knit, and I've been doing the lace, my brain's kind of exploding with, um, having to concentrate while I knit, although I do listen to audiobooks, and so this is my mindless knit for now. Uh, because it's all just ribbed for the next however long, nine inches I think, I haven't worked what, out what that is in centimetres. Um, so I'm using some wool that comes from my mother's stash, uh, so it's probably been sitting around for 20 years or so. This is a uh, sport weight, classic bluebell by Patterns, uh, and the colour is 4329, so that's quite a slate grey I guess it's a crepe crepe wool uh, like ply I don't actually know what that means but anyway uh, it just is crepe I can tell so I don't know what that means in terms of my spinning but uh, there's that and then I've got some leftover this was from the first Felix uh, I had a um, this leftover Rowan Kitsil case I'm really hoping that's enough I I thought it was a full skein it I had wrapped it back up in its label, so I'm presuming it's a full skein, but, in which case, there will be plenty, but if not, it's going to be a short hat, or <laughs> something, I don't know. Anyway, I'm enjoying that uh, immensely. I started that yesterday, and it's really quite lovely. Um, I love the texture that's coming out. Apparently, mohair, some people don't like it next to their face. Tough. Tough. Whichever, whichever young person get it, gets it will wear it and be grateful, although not on Christmas Day because it's midsummer. Um, ooh, look, random bits of fleece are floating everywhere now. I'm going to be tidying up that for the rest of my life, I think. So, anything else? Oh, yeah, so in order to get the correct... Uh, correct um, can you tell I have issues with being able to see things at the moment? I... I'm wearing contact lenses that supposedly mean I can read as well a sea distance. No. <laughs> no, no, no. Can't see anything and it's quite debilitating. So I've got these, you know, little supermarket kind of magnifiers as well. But on, off, on, off, it's just a disaster really. But anyway, that's all right. Um, in order to get the right uh, needle size for that, which I think was a 3.25, uh, I had them tied up in my old Yume whip and much as I love the Yume pattern and I am definitely going to knit it I did not love the yarn that I was knitting it with which was a second hand Mo, um, Angora Angora something um, and it was lace weight and I was holding it double but there were two big cones it was burgundy colour and it smelt dusty and I was just not wanting to knit it and I wasn't convinced that I was knitting it the right size as well as I'm famous for knitting everything too big you see so I have just taken the needles out of that and I'm going to frog it 
I'm going to cake up those cones and well skein up skein it up first and uh, wash it before I try knitting anything with it and I think you know it can go into socks and things like that but it's just it was quite a an intense 1990s kind of burgundy red that just didn't quite do it for me I do, it just felt a bit elderly for for where I'm at at the moment even though I am quite elderly but I don't know it just didn't, wasn't working for me so and I didn't want to knit it I wasn't picking it up mainly because of the smell I think very dusty mm. um yeah so that's basically all my knitting at the moment so I've got two new cast ons which are my new passion I've been doing a lot of the there's no point showing you because I've got them all in a box way over there. Um, a, lot, a lot of the squares for my um, patchwork blanket, scrappy blanket that I'm doing for the cabin up on the hill. Uh, and we've only got about, probably about 15 squares to go on that and then I can start uh, crocheting it all together which is amazing actually. I'm sure it will, will take a long time but... It's a good way of using up all my leftovers. So there's quite a bit of leftover honeydew that I can put in, and I'm sure there'll be leftover of this uh, this dark brown as well. Um, so I'm looking forward to that being done. It would be great if that was done before we next have visitors in the cabin, but that's going to happen, and that is okay. One day at a time, Meg. Um, so. Other things that are happening in my life at the moment, uh, my partner's away at the moment, so I am head down in my own bits and pieces, but also responsible for quite a few animals and watering the gardens and things like that. So, uh, yes, yes, it's interesting. <laughs> I'm just really hoping we don't have a ram escape or something like that, but I have lots of fantastic neighbours who will just take pity on me if anything ghastly happens and I need help, I'm sure they will. Um, oh, I had my birthday uh, up since the last uh, episode and for that uh, we didn't really have anything planned but then my partner sort of said um, let's go shopping and spend some money and I was like woohoo, we don't have any money but we did anyway. Um, and we bought a coffee machine, a decent espresso proper coffee machine and so I have been quite caffeinated and highly sort of oh, I mean I'm a little bit hyper anyway so you add uh, real caffeine to the mix instead of uh, you know just instant and things and it's but it's a lovely ritual and it's actually faster than boiling the jug on the gas stove so uh, the kettle um, so yeah it does feel like quite a luxury I think uh, so that was my birthday present and uh, something we both enjoy. Uh, yes, in terms of worky things, I'm, I've been asked to. So, you know, you know, in clubs they have those big trophy uh, boards, you know, the honours boards, and it's all, they're everyone's names of who's won what cup, and so on since 1960, whatever. Um, and the, the names and the years are normally done in gold leaf. Well, I've been asked to update those for the golf club, and there's quite a lot. They're qu quite a few years behind because gold leaf is really expensive. So um, I've been experimenting with gold leaf paint instead of um, doing actual gold leaf uh, because I don't really want to learn how to do gold leaf. It seems like quite a specific skill, and the, the concept of trying not to waste 24 karat gold sheets and also, <clears throat> yeah, and because I, I was I watched a few videos and you know the glue has to be absolutely the perfect amount of tacky before you apply the gold leaf and, and so on and and there was quite a bit of equipment involved and I was just like oh can we paint it instead so I've been experimenting with that and I'm hoping that they'll be happy with that and that's going to keep me quite busy for a week or two actually there's um, a lot to do there. And then if that works out, then there's a lot of other clubs around the area that have the same issue. And I also, I do like doing um, quite a few of the honours boards um, for competitions in the, that are up on the wall in the pub, uh, done with pyro pyrography, like 
wood burning and I've got a wood burner and I've got all the equipment for that. No, that's easy, I can do that. I could also do engraving and things like that for metal things, but um, yeah, just the gold leaf was, maybe that was just a, a skill too far that I didn't want to learn. So I'm hoping they'll, they'll be okay with just me painting it, keep very carefully with the, with the gold leaf imitation paint. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So that's uh, that's my sort of worky thing at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, oh the life, <laughs> uh, the the my partner picked up a fawn. Um, he was uh, pruning uh, pine trees out in the forest and uh, found a wee fawn and just just born, just sitting there. Mother was nowhere to be seen, and he carried on sort of pruning and he went away and he came back half an hour later and it was still there, hadn't been moved and he was pruning right next to it, didn't didn't move um, and uh, you know, branches were sort of falling on it <laughs> it just didn't go anywhere well, I've since uh, done quite a bit of research and apparently that's how they keep themselves safe their mother goes away and, and, and whatever um, and uh, they just keep quiet and keep still and you can't see them, you cannot see them, it's amazing Anyway, he brought her home, and her name was Ruiha, which is uh, uh, Māori for Louisa. And, uh, yeah, we kept her for a couple of weeks, fed her on the bottle, and she trotted around the house. I'll pop in some video. Um, she was very, very tame right from the right from the word go, no fear at all, and um, very attached to us, very affectionate, just loved cuddles and pats, and sat sat with the dog and <laughs> cuddled up and uh, yeah so definitely thought we'd, that we were mum and uh, obviously we sort of to keep her long term it was one of those why do we have a fawn exactly but also what a life experience because they're quite they're just really They're not they're not normally easy to see in in the in the wild. I mean, we my partner hunt, hunts them for meat, uh, not the babies, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, but he's quite good at seeing them. I have never I have been spent so much time in the forest out here, looking and looking and looking, uh, and cannot I've never seen one. Um, they just incredibly well camouflaged and incredibly still the only time I've seen one is when it at night time when it sort of came out in front of my car on the road and and sort of trotted away in front of me and I'm just like following it along thinking surely it's going to go off the side at some point which it did but yeah I've just yeah never never seen one out in in the bush at all so uh that was pretty exciting actually that was really hard and um definitely sort of took quite a lot of time and mental energy just because it was it's so amazing to have her in the house and in the backyard which is gorgeous they make a little noise like a little squeak noise it's just like that sound you know when you've got a really tight blown up balloon and you rub your thumb on it and, and it was kind of like that and it was just these little squeaks so cute so cute um yeah so that's really all that's happening with me um the new book i'm listening to is kate atkinson's uh human croquet i'm only up to chapter two already amazing characters and the plot's just suddenly done this huge twist into time travel and, and so on and um while still being satisfactorily kind of english <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, so be beautiful, beautiful text, beautiful reading, just amazing. And, you know, you really, audiobooks are an interesting thing because I've been listening to uh, lectures about the Iliad and I've also bought Dan Stevens reading the Iliad as well, which I haven't listened to it yet. But I studied it at university and it was... Um, I think it's going to be quite a different experience to hear it being told as a storyteller because that's how it's meant to be received. And I'm feeling the same thing with a lot of these audio books that, you know, it's actually quite a different experience. Like it's such a different experience seeing something on stage or hearing the music or um, whether you then read the book or see a movie or listen to the book being read to you. Um, it's it's quite it just feels quite different in the brain it's really wonderful thing to do while you're knitting and spinning i do recommend it um yes yay 
Yay for Audible. Amazing. Although it is Amazon Amazon owned, but what can you do? The, the material's just too good. Too good. So that's me, really. I'm sitting here surrounded by some successes this time and some real motivation. I'm just just loving everything that I'm doing and I feel feel like it's coming together. I'm sure I, I've never yet had a project that doesn't have a lot of mistakes. Well, I don't think there's actually any mistakes in this one, come to think of it. This one might be, because I think, because I, it was the second time I tried the pattern. So there's a lesson there. You know, you don't necessarily always get it right the first time. And, and maybe you just need to give it another go. But you do have to love the pattern. But it is a good way of getting your money's worth, isn't it? <laughs> I am thinking of the old um, Too Large Felix with the hand spun held double with this uh, the Rowan Kidsill case, the grey one, which is episode two, I think it was. Um, I am thinking of frogging that and doing something else with that yarn, just because I put a lot of time into it and I don't want to wear it. It just, it's not the right, like there are some types of patterns, like the big cable knit can be oversized and it will be fine. Big sweater is fine, but a cardigan that's too big, that's kind of a bit cropped, but still too big. It's just awkward. You know, it looks like it. Yeah. So I think I think I might reuse it. But I, when I frog it, I'm going to have to keep the Kid Silk K's held double with it, I think, because there's just no way I'm going to separate all that from my... <laughs> Imagine trying to separate a frog, like, a mohair silk lace strand from hand spun. Yeah. No, no. I, I do you know, have some, some, some uh, respect for my own mental health. So yes, that's me. Um, I, I have now started keeping my journal in this fantastic, oh, this is what I bought for myself for my birthday. God, I'm so terrible, but I have. It will last for the rest of my life. But I bought this from Turkey, um, Galen Leather, and they're handmade, um, and it's a journal cover. And it's just designed to just wear and be old and knocked around. And it's incredible quality. So I keep my, my journal in there, which is all my lists of everything, right down to my grocery lists and my, my hand handmade diary sort of planners and things like that, because I'm a geek. Uh, yes, my my mum's watch that she got when she was uh, 16 and so on. I've got a Swiss Army knife card there, a little tracker in case I lose it. I've got everything I could need in here. I've also got... in in here, <laughs> my book, my uh, Kobo, uh, yeah, it's a Kobo, and uh, yeah, my car keys, and a bottle opener, <laughs> just in case, you know, sometimes you're out and about, and you want to open that bottle of cider, and yeah, my partner does it with his teeth, but I am not going to do that, because my teeth wouldn't handle it, so that's my, my new baby that goes with me everywhere as well, and it's just like, life is art, life is art, and uh, I know I'm ranting a little bit now, but um, yeah, I think you've got to surround yourself with with beauty as long as you're not, um, <sighs> you need to have some input into it, I think, yeah, like making things or having a connection to the artist or, yeah, don't just go shopping. <laughs> Shopping's fun, though, sometimes when you feel a bit sad. Anyway, that's life from uh, Aotearoa, New Zealand. I hope you're all doing well and thank you for joining me and I can't wait to see you all again next time when I hopefully have uh, given some beautiful gifts uh, to, to family. Oh no, hopefully I'll see you before then. Yeah, we'll see how much knitting I get done. Anyway, thank you. See you next time. Bye. Ta! <laughs>